was your first expedition and how did this influence your further studies? I participated in the Challenger expedition between 1872 and 1876 to gather information and data on a diverse range of oceanic features. As a pupil at the time, I was fascinated by the discoveries made and I was enthusiastic to continue on with my geographical studies. Is this the reason you chose to undertake further studies? Yes, I was so interested in the discoveries made that in 1880 I became a student at the University of Oxford where I studied biology with a specialisation in zoology. I continued to a fourth year to study history. I was then elected to carry out a research scholarship in geology. So, what is geography to you? Geography's main function to me is to trace casual relations between geography and history. It will help us understand current world events and predict future events and trends around the globe. There's been a lot of speculation about your trip to Mount Kenya. What did you do on this trip? What a beautiful mountain Kenya is. Very graceful and not stern, but as it seems to me with a cold feminine beauty, the whole thing took me about three months. Count Samuel Teleki and Joseph Thompson had both failed to get to the very peak of the mountain, so I decided to conquer it. Indeed, my expedition was conceived as a propaganda move against the spread of German influence across East Africa, but this was not my main interest. Our food ran out relatively soon, and some of the Swahili porters, poor devils, that we had collected attempted to leave our party. People critique me for not handing in my diaries and notebooks as a single volume. They say I was hiding my mistreatment and murder of the African porters. All I can say to them is that it's just pure speculation, nothing more. Did this influence your opinion of free trade and imperialism? During 1899, I was active in imperial affairs and strongly believed in free trade. I frequently delivered lectures on the great trade routes. In fact, it was after this trip that converted my views to protectionism, the restriction of trade and introducing tariffs. My optimism that year was replaced by the fear that free trade Britain would eventually not be able to cope or compete with other great powers that held tariffs. It was 1900 that I contested as a liberal imperialist. It was three years later that I focused my attention on education, to improve education about the empire and within the empire. Your theory of the heartland was seen as quite controversial. Can you tell us more about your views on it? Before it became known as the heartland theory, it was called the pivot state. It was this idea that Russia was the heart of this, because this is the area which I saw as being the most important political nation. I went on to adapt this in democratic ideals and reality, and that is when the term the heartland came about. I believe who rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, and who rules the world island commands the world. I believe that the time for exploring the world was nearing its end, and that this produced a closed system. I saw the world island as Europe, Asia and Africa. Whoever was in control of this would mean that they would have an overwhelming amount of both material and human resources. I believe that it was the majority of Russia and Eastern Europe who were in the heartland of this world island, so they had control. Nazi Germany was close to conquering the heartland, as they were influenced by my work on the heartland theory. This is why my theory was seen as unpopular.